Good morning, good morning. Hi everyone. This is a Jewish Talk coming to you live from Nassau Community College on 90.3 WHBC. Also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes apps. We are, can be seen in the studios on my Facebook live page and the Facebook of WHBC. And therefore, our program is double-faced <laughs> on two Facebook pages. Fantastic. Of course, this program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So, hi there. My name is Rabbi Pearl. Oh, Gavalt. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. It all depends on when you're listening or watching. So, let's begin. You know, yesterday on the Jewish calendar was the 17th day of the Hebrew month of Thomas. Normally, if that would have been a weekday, it would have been a fast day. Except because it turned out to be on the Shabbos, it's pushed off to today. Therefore, today, dear friends, it's going to be a very fast program because I'm fasting. Today is the 70th day, the Shabbos of Thomas. Today, we are marking this day. The reason why we're fasting on the 17th of Thomas is because on this day, the walls of Jerusalem were broken, allowing the enemy to enter the city. We'll talk about way back, the onslaught that began today went on for three weeks until the ninth day of the Menachem of when the holy temples were destroyed. So indeed, my friends, the entire next three weeks, this period from the 17th of Thomas through the 9th of Av, which today would be the July 21st through August 11th, is observed in the Jewish community as a time of mourning. So today is the start of this three-week mourning period for the destruction of the Jerusalem and the two holy temples. Now the actual fast today actually commemorates other tragics as well, because on this very day, on the 17th day of Thomas, this is the day when Moses came down the mountain, as I'm sure you've all seen the movie, and I read the book, of course, the Torah tells us, Moses came down the mountain and he broke the tablets. It was on this day when he saw the worshipping of the golden calf and the tablets were broken. So, Again, welcome everyone. Welcome to all those listening to us on WHBC and to Harvey Kipnis. Good morning. Harry Oates is back in town. Gene, thank you so much. Good morning from Gene Branstein and to Stephen Mark Shaw. Went fantastic. Jonathan Wolf is back from Chicago. Fanta- the duct is back. And uh, thank you, Dr. Kilshevsky. Or did we say you're going to be called a new na- a doctor from now on? Uh, Dr. Kilbride. And uh, Zalman, thank you so much, and uh, good morning from Louis Pushkin. John, uh, Gene Sant, he's uh, actually listening to us in Dalton, Georgia. Wow. Uh, Dr. Kilshevsky from Connecticut. Let us know where you're calling from so all of us can know. And um, uh, Dr. Kilshevsky tells me that the book is better than the movie. I'm, this is the first time that I'm actually agreeing with what the doctor has to say. And... Um, Here we go. So we're going to discuss, good morning to uh, Dr. Patty Fuchs, my very best to your mother, to Gus, Gus, good morning, and to everybody. And if you um, post yourself, we'll be happy to recognize you. Well, you know, on the morning, all of us, I'm sure, are now have been inundated wherever we go, wherever we read, all about the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. It was on the morning of July 16th, 1969. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins lifted up for the moon. As we know, four days later, on July 20th, Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Aldrin set foot on the moon's surface. Armstrong's first words from the surface of the moon were, remember those famous words? That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So... Apollo 11 mesmerized the world. According to NASA, 650 million people tuned in. That's just about half of the amount of people who tune into our uh, Chabad house in Mineola. But 650 million people tuned in to watch the landing 50 years ago. It also changed the way we understood our solar system. 50 years have passed. The amazement caused by Apollo 11 has not worn off nor has the vitality and the urgency of the lesson that I'm about to share with you. Um, Let me just tell you a little bit about the prelude to the mission. Let's go back to the events that preceded the landing of the moon. 
on December 21, 1968, that would be seven months before the landing of the moon, man finally, for the first time in history, broke the bounds of the Earth. What happened? Three Apollo 8 astronauts, that was Frank Borman, James A. Lovell, and William A. Anders, took the first trip around the moon. So this seven months before they went on the moon, the astronauts went around the moon. Now the flight was initially planned as another Earth orbiting checkout of the Apollo hardware. But rumors that the Soviets were plotting to beat us into orbit around the moon caused this last minute change in plans. So on December 25, as the world held its breath, the three NASA astronauts conducted 10 orbits of the moon, 10 of course, the one to make a minion, and made it safely back to Earth two days later on December 27. This space mission, this served as an important prelude to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's actual landing on the moon seven months later on July 20th, 1969. Here, I, here I'd like to share with you that, that that very same week, on Thursday, December 26th, another far less known event took place. This one took place in a small studio in New York City. It was with Barry Farber, a popular Jewish radio talk show host. Now, he um, is actually today 89 years old. And in 2002, industry publication Talkers Magazine ranked him, this is Barry Farber, the ninth greatest radio talk show host of all times. Now, I checked out that, that Talkers Magazine recently, and I found my name, my name was on the back of the back of the back of the book under the na under the word co co uh, you know copyrighted so i'm not even in the in the list at all but, but but that's a humbling experience so barry farber interviewed a at that time rabbi zalman posner a distinguished rabbi from nashville tennessee and it was a discussion about the traditions of judaism and of course the symmetry went worked well between the rabbi and Barry Farber because uh, he, uh, as you know, Barry Farber was also a southerner growing up in North Carolina. Now, here is the question that he tried to stump the rabbi with. And in a moment, you'll see the connection with our discussion of the moon landing. And if anybody uh, remembers Barry Farber, why don't you post it on, the, on our uh, Facebook if you remember that, and I want to say hello to uh, Lawrence Swenson. Oh, my God. Label. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, and of course, we have a comment here. Stepping onto the moon was a giant step for humanity. What can be said about Moses stepping on Mount Sinai? He actually had to be very careful when he stepped on there because I think there was some animals uh, left something there. Anyway, so welcome, everyone. And... Um, I'm going to share, continue now to say hello to Melissa Renee and to Karen Dumbeck, and good morning to you. And now we're now discussing a little bit of an interesting prelude on the prelude on the prelude, what was going on on a radio station uh, at that time when they first circled, orbited the moon. And this was the question Barry Farber had of the rabbi. He was rather perturbed. On why does Judaism dare to interfere in the private lives of individual human beings? This was his protest. How dare the Torah instruct people, tell us what to do, what to say, what to eat, what not to eat, enough already. How can we justify such a violation of human rights? Is it anyone's business if I eat a ham sandwich? Well, today actually I wouldn't be eating a ham sandwich because it's a fast day. How can one take such a document seriously? How can we maintain such a book as divine unless God is, no, for, for no better word, pernicious? So the rabbi tried to give an answer. What he did was, he actually reported back to Rabbi Schneerson of his, conf of his uh, conversation with Barry Farber. And this is how the rabbi responded uh, a couple of days later. So again, the actual conversation on radio was on Thursday night, December the 26th, 1968. 
a few months before the Apollo landed on the moon. So on the following Shabbos, that would be December 28th, one of the great leaders of our sages of our time, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Nachem and Lushnason, of sainted memory, he held an unexpected assembly with thousands of his disciples at his headquarters in Brooklyn. The rabbi was there, Rabbi Zalman Posner, and he had shared with the Rebbe this conversation. The Rebbe began his address by stating that although initially he did not schedule to hold a Fabreng in this Shabbos, the events of the week inspired him to change his plans. Because many questions and reflections were evoked in people's minds as a result of the space mission to the moon. There was all kinds of questions. If a person arrived on the moon, do, do they still have to keep the Shabbos? Do the laws of Sabbath or the laws of Kashrus or any laws of Judaism uh, apply to a person when he's on the moon? Well, I mean, the, the, the Torah was given on this, on this planet. He's on another planet. So the Rebbe felt because of these many questions and plus many more, he was compelled to elaborate on them during this Shabbos assembly. Then he turned his attention to the Thursday night radio interview and the exchange between the rabbi and the radio host, show host, Barry Faber. And the Rebbe went on to explain that if we were to reflect on the major event of the week, which was NASA's space mission around the moon, we would find an answer to Barry Faber's question of why does Judaism, or why does Torah, why does God have so much to say about what we should and what we shouldn't be doing in our lives. And the Rebbe went on to explain. Before the three astronauts boarded the Apollo, they were instructed how to conduct their daily schedule while on the spaceship in the most exacting detail. They were told that what to wear, how to put on their shoes, what to eat, when to eat, how to sit, how to move around, how to sleep, and even how to tend to their bodily needs. Almost every part of their behavior, from the most external to the most intimate, needed to confirm to the meticulous instructions outlined by the space experts. Can you imagine, dear friends, if during mid-flight one of the astronauts would decide to take things into his own hands and say, light up a camel, light up a cigarette to enjoy a smoke, he would be naturally be, uh, you know, rebuked. Now, is that fair? Here is an individual. Is, isn't he not entitled to make his own choices and light up a cigarette when he feels like it? Of course, this is obviously a foolish thing for me to say. If you were to ignite a cigarette or eat the wrong food in the privacy of your own home or on the street corner, I guess that's your business. But if you ignite a flame or deviate from some other you know, prescribed rules of conduct, when you're in a mission in outer space, man, this cannot be seen as an isolated act, affecting merely your own individual life. Rather, we must view this act in the proper context. Here, a seemingly insignificant aberration of few rules, what would it be happening, would be placing three lives in danger. It is sending a multi-billion dollar investment to the garbage dump and is lying waste decades of sweat, toil and energy by a mind-staggering number of scientists and engineers in preparing for this mission. Finally, this little deviation of the rules may destroy, in a single moment, the dreams, the hopes of an entire country and perhaps the entire world. Think about this. It had taken almost $24 billion to give Neil Armstrong a chance to walk on the moon for two hours and 40 minutes. i just let you know, dear friends, uh, membership in our Chabad house doesn't cost $24 billion. So it's much cheaper to walk in, in our hallowed uh, synagogue. I'm laughing, everybody. Don't, don't, don't take me so seriously. But think about this. It cost America $24 billion to give Neil Armstrong a chance to, moon, to go on the moon to spend two hours and 40 minutes. The Apollo mission was the culmination of decades of work by an estimated 400,000 people working across dozens of science, technology, and engineering disciplines. All of this would be lost because this guy, as an example, hey, wants to smoke a cigarette. That would be chutzpah, as we would say in English, and selfishness. 
right, for doing that. If you are ready to destroy three human lives, a multi-billion dollar investment, the tremendous labor of hundreds of thousands of men and women for decades long, if you are prepared to kill a mission eagerly anticipated by the entire world, and why? Why would you want to do What? <laughs> so you can fulfill a selfish craving of smoking a cigarette. My friends, this is a demonstration of incredible inhumaneness, apathy, and narcissism. Though a little far less obvious, it, this is true about our lives as well. The history of mankind it really is a single harmonious voyage, extending from the beginning of creation to the end of time. All of us. That means all of us listening and watching and all of us who are not listening and watching have been chosen and placed together on a little planet suspended. It's suspended in the world, in the planet, in, in, the, in the galaxies, just like the space shuttle in midair and have been charged with the task of generating a kiss between the heaven and earth. That's our mission. Together, all of us living on the planet travel a long and challenging journey through space and time. We're all assigned with a mission. What is our mission, my friends? To sanctify the world and to turn it into a beautiful, harmonious abode for goodness, love, and holiness. Each and every individual who ever lived and will ever live we're all indispensable to the journey of our planet towards redemption. History is a grand play, and we all contribute our verse. The human story is a composition in which each of us contribute our notes. If our notes are lacking, history remains flawed and wanting. So yours and my contribution is absolutely necessary. Each of us are indispensable in God's vision of the world because each of us are chosen to fulfill a mission that you and only you and only me can accomplish through our thoughts, our words and our actions and on a daily basis. Our sages put it this way. The first human being, Adam, was created alone. Why? In order to teach us. Each and every one of us are obligated every day to say to ourselves, Bishvili Nivra Ha'olam. For my sake, the world was created. Now, this is not about arrogance. It means that we have to assess how valuable each of us are and imagine as though we were the only human being in existence. Hello, I'm talking to you. This is not drama. It's actually true. Because there is something at stake in our lives, in our daily moral choices, because that affects each of us how we live in public and in private affects the entire planet and the entire cosmos the past the present and the future so just as in the space shuttle one wrong move by a single astronaut can derail the mission so it is with the space mission granted to humanity the day our planet was formed and commenced its journey. See, each and every one of us plays an indispensable role in bringing our mission to its completion. So, what is our manual? The Torah. It was given to the astronauts, to each of all of us, for a grand mission. It's the divine blueprint that guides the human being on how to achieve his or her mission of transforming the psyche the psychic, I could say, and the entire world. So when the Torah talks to us and tells us what we do, what we don't, what we eat, etc., if we see ourselves in the proper context, we will all realize that our acts generate vibrations throughout the entire cosmos. And how we live our life, as we can see today coming out of the uh, Congress, what goes on has an effect. Everything we do impacts the destiny of the entire spacecraft and all of history. In this case, of course, repair is possible, but nothing will be the same. But all of us are grand players, and we have to be very careful not to live a mediocre life and dismiss our behaviors as trivial. Eh, who cares? But everything, everything is important. 
and we realize we're on this mission to get uh, to, together. So the journey to the moon that all of us are celebrating and all of us are thinking about and reading and watching, the journey to the moon then was not only about one step, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, it also taught us something even more critical. Each step of every person at every moment is a giant leap for mankind. And the question we must ask ourselves today is, in which direction? Only you and I and all of us together can provide that answer. And I want to say thank you for everybody. I want to say hello to, uh, let's see, if, who else is watching us? Um, thank you very much. Jeff Rosner, thank you so much for caring. An easy fast. I'll be coming over to you to break the fast. Larry Crivello, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and everybody. So, uh, you know, the moon, we talk about the moon. It's very central in Jewish tradition. Here we are, 50 years later, remembering what the Apollo did, landing on the moon. And the famous words, that's one small step for man and one great leap for mankind. And as President Richard Nixon said at that time, for one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all of the people on this earth are truly one. So moon plays an important role in Judaism. It's both a metaphor and a measure of our days. So as the world marks half a century since we first ventured to the moon, I'd like to share some interesting facts about the moon, some Jewish facts about the moon, and how we see the importance of the moon. First of all, to be aware that our calendar, Judaism's calendar is based, differs from the secular Gregorian calendar that many of us use today. The Jewish calendar relies heavily on the moon cycle to regulate the Jewish, moon, the Jewish months. The Hebrew calendar has 12 months, time to coincide with each lunar month. The time it takes the moon to orbit the earth and return to the same spot in the sky as viewed from the earth. That's the length of each lunar month. The lunar month is roughly 29.5 days, so the Hebrew month, the Jewish month, is either 29 or 39 days longer. Now, since the lunar year is shorter than the solar year, if, it's followed, if we follow the moon exclusively, the Jewish calendar would drift through the seasons, like the Muslim calendar does. What would happen, it would, the holidays would fall earlier and earlier each year. So a purely lunar calendar has 354 days long. Without adding leap days, the Jewish calendars would occur at different, Jewish holidays would occur at different seasons in different years. So in order to regulate this, to make sure, like for example, Passover falls out in the spring, which is essential that Passover is in the spring, the Jewish calendar uses leap months. So in uh, every 19-year cycle, you will always find seven leap months uh, are added. It happens to be this is one of the years. Also interesting, as, as an interesting fact on the moon, in terms of the uh, Jewish fact, as the moon orbits the earth, it appears to grow larger, waxing, then smaller, waning each day in the night sky. At the end of the 29.5 day cycle, the moon reemerges as a nascent crescent. This is called the new moon, Rosh Chodesh, and it indicates that a new Jewish month has begun. That's how we coincide our calendar. Since the year 358 CE, Jewish people around the world have calculated the exact date of each month from a set calendar. Before then, though, the new moon on the uh, celebration of the new month was proclaimed by a special Jewish court in Jerusalem called the Sanhedrin. Made up of 71 learned sages, the Sanhedrin would wait until at least two witnesses came to them with the news of the very first sighting of the new moon. After hearing from the witnesses, the Sanhedrin would send word throughout the land of Israel and beyond that the next month had begun. The Jewish New Moon, uh, we actually it's a festival. The first day of each Jewish month is a mini holiday. Uh, there have special prayers added, somewhat little extra celebrations. Each month, we sanctify the moon. It's called Kiddush Levana. They do it amazingly in Connecticut, and also in Vermont. Jewish 
people around the world each month recite a beautiful prayer early in the cycle of the new moon as it waxes in the sky. It's usually said following the first Shabbos after Rosh Chodesh. It's called Kiddush Levana. The sanctification of the moon prayer is one of the most beautiful in Jewish liturgy. The prayer speaks about uh, many aspects of the new moon and how we all uh, have certain attributes that like the moon, that constantly renews itself. Just like the moon goes bigger and smaller, so too a person should always have consistent growth in their life. It's very poetic, this prayer. In one part, during this prayer, we actually rise onto our toes while gazing at the moon, and we say the words, Just as I dance towards you but cannot reach you, so may none of my enemies be able to touch me for evil. Under the light of the moon, we turn to each, each other. This is once a month, even if we see each other every day. But during this particular prayer services, as we sanctify the moon, we turn to each other and wish each other Shalom Aleichem, peace and with you. So each month, my friends, in our calendar, as the new moon is recognized in the sky, we turn to each other and speak of peace. Wow, what a lesson. It's a powerful moment to remind us, remind us of the moon's beauty and to help us appreciate afresh the world that God created and making a difference. On Shabbos, I spoke about this as well, that uh, Jewish women in the mystical tradition, Jewish women are seen have a very special connection to the moon. And they celebrate that. And uh, Kim, I want you to know that in the, in the, in the, in the June, on this Rosh Chodesh, beginning of the month, women don't uh, cook or uh, sew or do laundry or that. And I know many who don't do that any time, so not, not to make a mistake at that particular time. But to conclude, my friends, the, um, I read a very interesting sci-fi, about a sci-fi film way back called Butterfly, where a man was able to go back in time and he went and he, and he killed a butterfly. Then he followed through because what he did so many years earlier, its ripple effect, this butterfly effect that happened years later. My friends, just look around your room, look around your family, look around your friends, look around the world and realize all of us today, we are where we are today because someone in our background did the right thing so that didn't destroy but lived and worked hard and kept going so that we would have the results. How careful we must be of using every moment, as I said, you know, uh, appreciating the, the Apollo 11, what it represented. And again, this was a, um, a journey to the moon was not only about one small step for man and a giant step for mankind. Taught is so important that all of us and are on a uh, spaceship. It's called the Earth. It's in hanging out in the orbit of the world and all of us, in a certain sense, are astronauts in every action that we do each step of every person at every moment is really a great giant leap for mankind the question of course is our directions so only you and i and all of us together can provide that answer have a wonderful day everyone and thank you for joining us stay well Zeigesund. <laughs>